Hi everyone, we have a lot of folks still dialing in. Thank you for joining us. We will get started here in a moment or two. Happy Thursday, everyone. I'm Anil Chavel with Archive Social. I want to thank you for joining us on this beautiful Thursday. And you have joined Archive Social's agency to agency presentation today, titled Once Upon a Timeline, Telling Your Community Story on Social Media, featuring Belinda Willis, the Director of Communications and Marketing out of the city of Mansfield, Texas, which is uh, just right around the Arlington area in the state of Texas near Fort Worth. Now, if this is your first time joining us here at Archive Social for an agency-to-agency -agency presentation. This is one of the great privileges that we have based on the work that we do across the public sector. Social media is such an exciting and powerful channel for disseminating information, humanizing your agency, being authentic, and having a true conversation with your constituents. We've had this great opportunity over the course of the past year and a half to showcase agencies across the country and have them tell their story about how they are using social media, the lessons they're learning, and how they're driving success for their agencies. We've had quite a few great presentations here in the first half of 2019. You can see them on your screen right now. We have those recordings available for you, but most excitingly, we have our presentation today, today's webinar, which again is focused on telling a story uh, and telling a community story on social media. Now, before we get into the presentation, I want to share a few housekeeping items. Everyone on the line here is on mute. We do have quite a few attendees, great audience dialing in today, uh, and we want this to be interactive. While you're on mute, we do want to hear your questions. We do want to answer them. We do want to have Belinda provide some additional insights past her presentation. So please do use the questions function on your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, in order to do that, look at the panel. You'll see a section called questions. Click on the little triangle next to it. You can enter that question there. We'll queue them up and we'll get to as many of those questions as we can as possible. We also had quite a few questions roll in ahead of the presentation uh, for those of you uh, who registered in the past couple of weeks. And so again, we'll try to cover as much of that as possible. Don't hesitate to ask a question. If we can't get to all of them, we'll certainly circle back offline. And there will be time for that Q&A and we will, of course, uh, send you these materials in email after the presentation today. So with that, I am your host, Neil Chow. I'm the founder and CEO at, here at Archive Social. Again, one of the most exciting things that I get to do is talk to our agencies, learn about their stories, and then uh, participate in this opportunity to share that story out to a wider audience. And today's topic is called Once Upon a Timeline, Telling Your Community Story on Social Media, featuring Belinda Willis, Director of Communications and Marketing out of the City of Mansfield. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Belinda in a moment, but that will be really the focus point of today's session is hearing Belinda uh, Belinda's story on how she tells her story and how she tells the story for the city of Mansfield. I'll then follow that with a, a brief update from the legal landscape that we at Archive Social pay quite a, quite a bit of attention to. We always like to share a few tips and tricks. It's our, our session called Cover Your Agency, and that'll lead us to our Q&A again, a good amount of time there for us to cover as many questions as possible. So let's talk about Belinda for a moment before we hear from her. Belinda Willis spent 20 years as an award-winning reporter before starting the City of Mansfield's first communications and marketing department in 2001. So quite a bit of tenure there at the City of Mansfield. And along the way, uh, she's led those efforts at the city. Belinda's also been heavily involved 
in the industry as a leader in government communications, serving as the past president of TAMIO, the Texas Association of Municipal Information Officers. She continues to be on the board there. She's also on the board of 3CMA, City, County Communications and Marketing Association. So again, two of the, the really prominent organizations in government communications. Belinda is quite the heavy hitter. Uh, we're really, really privileged to have her speak today. I've, I've been privileged to meet Belinda in person at these conferences. And of course, I'm excited that we get to hear your story today, Belinda. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me with you today. I am a little nervous, I'll admit to that, while I've done some presentations at um, other conferences, I, I haven't done a webinar before, so I'm outing myself. So please, um, so please bear with me here as I go through um, uh, my rookie status as a webinar presenter. But yes, we're here today to talk about um, community storytelling. <clears throat> it's something I'm really passionate about because like a lot of uh, us in government communications, I'm a former journalist. So storytelling is second nature to me. And with the, all the information that we have to get out to our residents and our constituents, we often forget about storytelling and that it's a really great way to do, uh, do that, get that information out and to connect with them. So today we're going to talk about some best practices for storytelling on social media, and we're going to look at some cities, uh, what they're doing in telling their story on social media. We're also going to take a look at a couple of companies that are really uh, kind of paving the way for storytelling on social media, and I think they've got a, a lot that we can learn from them. So why tell stories? Well, it's all about connecting on a personal level. Um, frankly, that's what we really need in government today. I don't know about anybody else, but my communication efforts sometimes are met very skeptically uh, from our constituents. So it really helps to develop a level of trust. And these stories can give your residents a really positive impression about your community. It really feel good stories. They go a long way to create those positive feels. And lastly, it's just more content for you and all your platforms to be able to think about storytelling. Oh, sorry. So this new era of creative storytelling has really been changed a lot by digital formats. Um, it, it changes the way we tell them. The structure on the digital formats means we have to have shorter narratives and have more visuals. We also um, need to include the audience sometimes because sometimes they're generating content for us through things that they post on social media. So promoting your brand through storytelling is best when you're using multiple formats. Uh, websites, videos, and social media are great formats for telling stories and then sharing them across all your platforms. And social media in particular is where content and multiple formats or transmedia really work well together. So community storytelling is more than just pushing out information to users. It's about taking a deeper dive into your community and looking at your community and even your organization to connect people personally. And it can be projects like roads or parks or issues like bond elections. You can even spotlight your own organization or individuals in your community. And some of the best storytelling is spontaneous. It's an unexpected moment that lends itself to greater attention and connects with your audience in a different way. So storytelling, there's some really interesting aspects to it and some boxes that you can check when you're thinking about your storytelling to see if it's if you're really hitting all the marks. It's great if it's organic, coming from an authentic place and an authentic voice. It's a conversational approach makes your audience more comfortable. And when you tap into emotions, your storytelling can be really inspiring and it has a domino effect. Because one thing that you want your storytelling to do is be a call to action for your audience, and inspiring stories have a tendency to do that. 
This is a really great graphic that I found that helps me when I'm putting content together for our social media, figure out whether or not I'm actually telling a story or whether I'm just spouting corporate speak. It gives me an opportunity to, to look at that. And you can evaluate whether you've effectively told your story to your audience based on whether you're using anecdotes or whether it's a compelling story. That's the voice you want when you're telling stories. So this chart can be really helpful for you. And I really pull it out occasionally when I'm working on content just to make sure that I'm covering all my bases. So when we're talking about storytelling and social media, we're talking about both importing stories and exporting them. Some of the best stories are out there in your community, and they're being told in community groups, or maybe it's a, a post that they put on one of your pages. But that dialogue between your followers and your platform can be really important to find uh, great storytelling. But you're also going to use it to tell the stories within your organization and export that those stories out. So whether it's an issue or you're introducing uh, uh, the employees in one of your departments to, to your community, you're exporting that information out to the community. One of the things that's really helped me a lot as I've explored the idea of storytelling in our social media content is to look at some other organizations and what they're doing. And so I thought we'd take a look at two of the ones that I, I really think are the most compelling. And the first is Southwest Airlines. They are using social media pretty um, innovatively in the corporate world. They're listening to their customers on social media 24-7, 365. They have a listening center where there are it's staffed all of that time just to look and see on social media where Southwest Airlines is being mentioned. And it's not just about handling customer service issues for them. They're looking for stories. And they have a campaign called Every Seat Has a Story, and it's generating a lot of buzz about what's happening at Southwest Airlines. And this particular story was one of their best ones. A young boy is watching planes take off with his grandfather, and he gets excited when a Southwest Airlines pilot opens the window in the cockpit and waves to him. So his mom shares that information on Facebook and Instagram, thanking South, Southwest Airlines for it, and they're listening. So they reunite the pilot and the boy at the airport the next week so they can connect. And they post it on their social media and their website and their blog, and the interaction between the boy and the pilot goes viral. And it was generated a great deal of positive PR for the airline, and that's something that's hard to do these days when you're talking about airlines. But their Every Seat Has a Story campaign has really given them an opportunity to tell some great stories. Another company that relies on storytelling is Microsoft. And it's so important to them that one of their executives actually has in his title, Chief Storyteller. So they're using storytelling to talk about all of the work that they're doing in countries all across the world where they're bringing technology to remote areas like villages in Africa and how that's impacting the lives of the people there. But they're also telling the story with, of their company and its employees, taking a look inside and sharing that with others, like this software engineer named Kyle who is autistic. So they provided information about his life and his work with Microsoft and how he connects that to his diagnosis of autism. So they're connecting with their audience on a personal level and their customers and their clients are getting positive impressions of Microsoft because of that. So I wanted to take an opportunity to show you some examples of social media storytelling. And these are from cities uh, around the country who are doing more than just pushing out information on their social media platforms. And that's what storytelling is really all about. It's about taking it one step further. So here's a couple of, of examples of transmedia storytelling, where you're using a platform to promote stories from your other mediums. So here in Mansfield, we have a news website where we provide information that's sort of like a newsletter, but it's all digital and it's online. And we have news stories and we have feature stories. 
And every story that's posted on the news website is also promoted on our social media platforms. And the, these here are stories where we're promoting a Parks and Rec summer camps, and we're also doing a feature story about road projects. The City of Arlington is doing the same thing here, and they're promoting a feature that's on their website about the city's first post office and the history behind it. And here the city of Round Rock is promoting a story that details its bond election or its bond program for road improvements. These are some of the same things that we cover every day in our cities and information that we're passing along to our residents. But finding a unique way to tell that story really enhances that information for our residents. Hey, a couple of other examples. Yes. Hey, Bill. So, Neil, real quick, sorry to jump in there. We did have a question come in from the audience, and the question was around if it's possible to get the slides more expanded or in full screen, uh, if you're able ah, to put it in the I'm presentation sorry. mode. Uh, folks are okay, looking at on. these examples, which are, which, are really, which are really telling, so appreciate that. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm the rookie. How's that? Is that better? Much better. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Like I said, I'm the rookie. Um, okay, so here's some other examples of storytelling. Um, this one is from the city of Arlington, and it was a video Q&A that they were doing about mosquito spraying. So they promoted it on their social media, but it was an extension of uh, some information they had on their website. We also told the story of an event through a recap video, which is a great way to continue telling the story about your community. We also promoted our volunteer program through a video feature and telling the story of some high school students that were creating a day of service in the community. And then Round Rock here recapped an arts event through video. And recaps through videos are a really great way to highlight your community and the event, and it really serves as a great promotion for next year's festival or event. Here's two examples of storytelling with Instagram. Um, our parks department shared the end of the year video to highlight the events and activities with residents that had happened all through the year. And this is uh, really one of my favorite ones, the city of Durham. I, I keep an eye on them because they do a lot of really great things with social media. And they used a photo of their annual budget retreat, which is something that's fairly boring and mundane. But they talked about it, their annual resident survey and sharing the report with the community and showing the fact that the kinds of things that they're talking about in their resident survey are the things that their council is dealing with at these um, at these events when they're talking at the budget retreats. I call this spotlight storytelling because you can use social media to turn a spotlight on a special event or a community program or even your own organization. These spotlight stories can really tug on the heartstrings sometimes and it a really compelling uh, post for your social media. We used the spotlight storytelling to talk about our annual Salvation Army Red Kettle Challenge, where we raise money through the Salvation Army. And Arlington used it to promote its new redesigned website. And posts about animals are always a really great way to get engagement. And the city of Arlington does a really terrific thing where they share photos of the animals that have been adopted at their shelter. They get pictures with their new family and post that information out there. And it, promotes the shelter and, and always gives everybody a really great feeling. You can't go wrong with animals. And this is Lenexa, Kansas, and they turned the spotlight on their annual art show because they wanted to encourage local artists to participate. So that gives them an opportunity to, um, to connect on a different level with some of their residents about this particular event. So we talked about spotlighting your organization in your social media storytelling, and Round Rock did that with this really great post and a video of one of its librarians that illustrated her commitment to the community and their families. And the Mountain View Police Department used their social media to introduce the community to its new community resource officer. He was a longtime patrol officer who was moving into a new role, and they wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to to meet him and learn more about him. 
So letting your community see the people behind the services you provide and, and telling their stories is a really great way to connect personally with your residents, and it gives them a really good impression about your city. And here's just a couple of more spotlight stories. Again, the Mountain View Police Department talked about its important gang prevention program and the impact it has on its community. And oh, by the way, the program needs uh, some help, and we hope that you can uh, we you can help us with this information and and these gift cards and will help us with supplies. So they used storytelling as a way to encourage people to donate to this particular program. And we used it. You can't go wrong when you're putting animals on your social media. And we used it to help get donations for what our shelter calls the Lucky Fund. And they use the Lucky Fund to pay for the medical care from some of the shelter animals that they get so that they're ready for adoption. So kids and dogs, it's a great way to connect with your audience and gives them an opportunity to learn more stories in your community. So this is what I call not boring news story telling. It's, um, it's taking something that's rather mundane and sharing the information in a unique way. Um, instead of just the standard post about an upcoming election or what's happening with the, uh, in the city that day, the city of Keller used a, a really beautiful photograph and they paired it with the community to-do list for the day. And I thought that was really a unique way to bring their uh, residents in on what was happening in the community in that day. It's a better way to approach the information, and it draws more people into the post. And Keller also used photos of a, um, of a difficult situation for a driver to remind residents that they needed to be careful in a construction zone during one of their road projects. Um, it, I'm so sure it was certainly embarrassing maybe for the driver of that vehicle, but it was uh, it brought home the, the point to the residents that this is something that we need to watch out for and um, we want we want to make sure you stay safe during this project. And this uh, for the city of Mansfield was um, our standard master planning information. And it can be really boring when you're trying to talk about master planning. So um, our parks department decided to experiment with Facebook Live. And they had their director there to answer questions from the community and provide information about the master planning process and getting feedback from them. And the post received a significant number of views and even though it was it happened in the middle of the day in the middle of the week and it allowed the department greater reach than just a standard public meeting and national observances can make great content for uh, for your social media and it offers opportunities to engage your residents and so the Pflugerville Library during Small Business Week ran a series of posts that highlighted the resources that were available to them and to small business owners at the library. So they were able to connect with a new audience that may not think of the library as being something that can be helpful to them. Now, organic storytelling is really great. Um, it's unexpected moments that happen that give us an opportunity to tell a story and connect with your audience. And yes, it's unexpected, but you have to really kind of be ready to and to look for them and, and, and be ready when they happen. So here's the Round Rock Police Department. They shared a photo on their Instagram of an interaction with a young boy, and he had a really touching request uh, of the officers because he wanted to pray for them, and so he wanted to know their names. So that's a really great, compassionate story that's going to connect with a lot of people. And it certainly wasn't a planned event, and the department wisely saw the opportunity when it happened. They also, the city of Round Rock used the aftermath of a storm to showcase their street crew. You know, those kinds of things happen all the time in our communities. And what happens after a major storm is the cleanup effort. So they wanted to remind residents that they're often called on to accomplish at a moment's notice some, some pretty significant things. So they shared the photo 
and uh, provided a, a, shared the video and provided information to let the, their residents know, hey, we were we were on target. We were there when the storm happened. We cleaned it up, and everything's back to normal now, thanks to these these folks in this department. And this other photo is one that was shared to us by um, a mom in our community. She just wanted to say thanks to the police officer who was at our nature park that helped her son learn to fish. And that's one of those organic moments that doesn't happen all the time. And she just shared the photo and we thought, you know, we're going to go ahead and get this out on our social media. And we were smart enough to recognize that um, our followers would love it, and they did. Just some more examples from, of some organic storytelling with photos. Uh, City of Round Rock um, just took a picture of one of their favorite spots and shared it with the community. And the silly, City of Keller did the same thing when a local photographer did a time-lapse photo of the, the eclipse. And this is a series of posts that we did here at the City of Mansfield that was told through the eyes of two dogs that ended up at our shelter. Um, these dogs were um, ended up at the shelter, collected there, and we found out that the owner had some medical issues that prevented him from um, repairing the fence where the dogs were getting it out and escaping. So we decided to bring this to the attention of our volunteer program who pulled together some volunteers to repair the fence for the gentleman, and we decided to... Um, uh, to just highlight this particular effort. Number one, to showcase the work of our volunteer program and to remind people how important it is to make sure your, your pets are safe. So we told this story through the eyes of Goofy and Zeta and continued it, the process. So we documented everything all the way down from the work being done on the fence to the reunion with, um, with their owner. An unexpected moment in a situation that we took advantage of so that we could uh, highlight some services and programs of the community. And this is probably one of my favorite ones, and it just happened recently, and it's organic storytelling at its best. Um, the local newspaper in Pflugerville had a typo about the anti prom event that was at the library. And it could have meant just a standard correction, but the library was really smart enough to recognize that they had a great opportunity, and they really milked it for all it was worth. So um, reminding their, their community that they were going to be serving snacks at the anti-prom, not snakes, uh, was really uh, a way to kind of play on a bad situation and an embarrassing situation for the paper, and it was... They did such a great job of it that it caught BuzzFeed's attention and ended up on BuzzFeed. They found a place in just about every corner of the library to play up the situation and to uh, look at the source of the error. And even the paper played along and provided snake snacks for the anti-prom event that they had. So I hope these tips and some examples have given you some insight into how to best use your social media platforms to tell stories. It's really about um, looking for the opportunities in all your platforms. You know, we use our archive social to look back at some of our previous posts and to see what the community is saying, to see if we've got some ideas for some stories that we may want to tell. We listen to our colleagues in other departments and even listen to your community. Look at the posts that um, that are happening in your community groups or that are being posted on your social media. And always remember visuals can enhance the storytelling um, and help give, uh, give some punch to what might be a rather mundane post. You can turn just about any content you have into really compelling stories. And it's going to improve the engagement on your page and it's going to create fans for your social media platforms. So thanks, everybody, and uh, we're here to answer questions if you need anything. Belinda, thank you so much for that presentation. I loved how rich it was with actual examples, both from the city of Mansfield and across the space. 
And the point that you made particularly about organic unexpected moments really hit a chord with me because uh, with the work that we do in the public sector, knowing that the historical mentality of government, uh, there's obviously a lot of risk in an unexpected circumstance. Uh, earlier days of social media, a lot of hesitance on adopting social media. And the point that you can take those unexpected moments and actually create an opportunity to really engage the audience, to really tell the story of the community is a really powerful point. Thanks again for sharing that. We are going to take a little bit of an interlude here um, as we get prepped for questions. So folks, stick around. We do have a lot of questions to get through. But we at Archive Social recognize that a lot, of, a lot of you in the audience come to us for guidance on legal policy issues. Again, our role is to channel what we're seeing in the space, be an advisor to you, and help in the ways that we can. And so we have this great segment called Social Media CYA, where we are here, of course, to help you cover your agency. And so I want to give you a brief update on what we are seeing in the news uh, and not in the news, essentially what's happening on the legal side of things, and uh, share some of the takeaways uh, in a way that hopefully can help you protect and cover your agency. So our first story this afternoon is, is coming in the space of First Amendment concerns. This is not a new space. If you've attended any of our webinars in the past 18 to 24 months, you've seen that there's quite a bit of news, or if you've actually looked at the news in the past 18 to 24 months, you've seen there's quite a bit of news around First Amendment rights, uh, concerns about First Amendment violation with government social media. And this is quite recent from March of 2019, coming out of the state of Alabama. John Merrill, the Secretary of State there, uh, got caught up in a bit of news around his social media account. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with, with, with John Merrill, this is a, a, pub, a, a public official that really uh, prides himself in his transparency, making himself accessible uh, and uh, to the extent that he provides his cell phone number out to his constituents. So, so a really great example of some of the things that politicians can do to be available to the general public. Uh, unfortunately, what happened in this circumstance is that on his uh, social media account, his Twitter account, uh, there were, of course, people responding with uh, views contradictory to his own, and he decided to start blocking these users. Now, this did not go unnoticed uh, by both the constituents and, and in a broader spectrum by groups around the country, including the ACLU. Now, again, if you've tuned into any of our webinars probably in the past six months, you've heard about all the different circumstances where the ACLU is taking action in states across the country where they feel that First Amendment rights are being violated. So the ACLU actually came forward with a lawsuit uh, alleging that he had violated First Amendment rights by blocking, again, Twitter users that had contradictory views to what he was expressing on his Twitter account. If you read this article uh, and you pay attention to this story, you'll actually see that multiple times uh, Mr. Merrill responds with essentially pointing out that this is his, his, tw his Twitter account, not the Secretary of State's Twitter account. And he was drawing a distinction there saying, I understand that the agency has the, the requirements and the expectation to be neutral. This is my Twitter account and I can express my views. Now again, he is the Secretary of State expressing views on, that, on the topics relevant to the agency. Again, this was uh, assessed, uh, you know, ruled upon, um, and you can evaluate in, in, in the circumstance, and abundantly clear that there is an important uh, area of confusion that we keep tripping over in, in the government social media space, particularly with public officials, where regardless of whether or not it's a Twitter account or a Facebook page representing an individual or the agency, if you are conducting public business, you are subject to the rules of public business. So key takeaway here is that oftentimes public officials and not just, not just the most prominent, but perhaps even those at your local level, are really unaware of the fact that their communications regarding public business on their Twitter and Facebook accounts do need to be treated just like any other official communication subject to your standard social media policy, subject to the standard rules around what you can remove as comments, what you can't remove, to the standard to the expectations on whether you block individuals. This is a public account expressing public business subject to public records. The big takeaway here. Now, we're going to flip to another story that you didn't read about, and for good reason, because this was a bit of a success story. And in this circumstance, a school district that we work with out in the state of Washington, the Evergreen School District, uh, had experienced a teacher strike, which led to a lot of controversy, uh, a lot of comments back and forth. Uh, the district had shared a video, which again, really, really kind of stirred, stirred the pot there. Uh, and, and bless my marketing team for saying passionate responses, right? This is where you get a lot of potential profanity, offensive language, a lot of emotions come out, uh, and, and we're all familiar with these circumstances that strike a chord. The district dealt with this. This was all on their social media pages, but they got past it. 
And as they moved forward, they wanted to be able to tell their story, keep that timeline clean and that timeline telling the story. And they didn't want this strike, which had passed, that had been resolved, to, to really pollute the nature of that conversation. So in this circumstance, they were able to remove comments, clean up that presence. And this is something that you can do in accordance with policy because they are following their policy. They're keeping records for public records requirements there in Washington. They were able to do all that and really control the narrative moving forward. So a little bit of an opposite situation there, give you some, 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 some thoughts on, on how you might work with public officials and how you might actually be able to remove content without infringing First Amendment rights as you pay attention to these policies. So good takeaways there. Now on the subject of public records, legal requirements, records requests, um, this is a topic that we, the, that uh, set of topics that we are well immersed in. Um, I'm going to take that conversation offline. So for those of you who would like to learn more about public records requirements in your state, you'd like to hear about well, what kind of other records requests might be happening that are not in the news but may have affected an agency in my county that may affect an agency like mine. Uh, we see dozens upon dozens of real records requests in legal situations involving social media. We can talk to you about that legal landscape and how it uh, aligns with the way you use social media. Happy to take that conversation offline. If you're at all interested in us reaching out to really fill you in on what we're seeing in the space, um, we'll do that. I'm going to put a poll up on the screen. Again, optional poll here. Reach out to us. Let us know. Um, go ahead and answer this poll if you'd like us to talk to you about these legal issues. Be very clear, uh, we do not talk about our product on this phone call. This is really about you, your social media, the legal circumstances, and any of these topics um, where we can be an assistance to you. We'd like to do it um, and really, really share the guidance um, and the lessons learned from, from around the industry. So I'm going to leave this poll up, and we're going to get back to Belinda. Belinda, we've had quite a few questions, again, come in, both prior to the presentation today and, of course, during this presentation. And so to kick us off, Belinda, you mentioned different types of social media sites. I gave the example of Instagram. Um, the question we have here is how to best tailor your approach as a city between these different platforms like Facebook and Twitter when, when you are storytelling? Uh, are you telling different stories on each, different themes? How, how, do, you, how do you mix and uh, mingle those different channels? Um, we're, we're really primarily using um, uh, Facebook and uh, Nextdoor. Uh, we don't really use a lot of our storytelling on Twitter other than just to direct people who are um, who are on our Twitter accounts to our Facebook or to our um, our news website so they can access more information there. Uh, the content is a, sometimes more abbreviated just to kind of whet somebody's appetite to the bigger story and then sending them to the platform where more information is. Does that answer your question? Gotcha. Okay. For, for sure. You, the, different, the different channels have uh, different uh, expectations on, on the brevity of the content. It sounds like you prioritize based on that channel. Uh, a more of a logistical question as you're, you've been, you've been uh, at the city of Mansfield for quite some time, and uh, this question that came in says, how do you keep these stories consistent when a staffing change occurs? Uh, and I love this comment um, in, as part of the question, posting is like leaving different fingerprints. Do you agree with that, Belinda? And again, how have you navigated staffing cha changes over the years? Well, uh, fortunately, we haven't had to navigate too many staffing changes. Our community is a smaller community that's growing, so we've actually had more staffing. And uh, we do have a communication and marketing team that we put together where we we talk a lot amongst ourselves about story ideas and the kinds of information that we want to see out there. And it really can be sometimes an education process for those outside the communication and marketing arena. Um, getting, my, uh, getting my public works director to understand uh, about storytelling and, and looking for those opportunities is sometimes difficult, but we've done our best as a team to create relationships within our organization so that they know they can come to us with ideas, they can come to us with uh, suggestions or concerns, and keeping that dialogue open with them. Um, having that core team has really been important for us. That makes a lot, lot of sense, uh, the notion of uh, having a staff change versus adding staff. There's a lot of similarities there, and, and really having that core team, that communication, constant communication with your departments um, is really a good good um, channel for, for addressing those different types of situations. 
Now, switching gears, we, we have some questions rolling in from our live audience. Um, given all the great examples that you shared with us today, a lot, very photo rich, right? A lot of those examples, very photo rich. And the question is, what are the rules for using photos? Uh, do you need to get some sort of official permission? If it's a public event, you do not. A uh, public event is, now we do, uh, some of our events, particularly where there are children, we have a signage that lets people know that there is a community photographer or staff that might will be taking pictures or video and making them aware that that's going to be happening. So if it's a public event, um, those uh, those concerns are, are not the same as if it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. So um, a lot of times we just make sure if we're for example, the, we checked with the mom who took the picture of our police officer and her son at the park. We checked with her first and made sure that she was okay with us putting it out on our social media channels uh, before we did. Um, and any time we're working on a story, so to speak, and it usually involves interaction with the subject matter. Um, so talking with the resident who was having the issue um, with his fence uh, and making sure he's okay with us getting that information out there. Um, so those kinds of situations where you have that one-on-one -on -one contact, it's, it's easy to, you know, gain permission and prepare them for the fact that you want to do it, uh, you want to put this out on social media. But public events are different. We, uh, we utilize um, all of our staff for photos and and for posting information on our social media and in public events. And, but we do post signs letting them know that photos are being taken and being used uh, in the city for on its website or on its social media channels. Got it. And on a, on a similar thread here, we had a question come in around uh, your actual staff. So we'd like, the question is, we'd like to know best practices for using employees' names and sharing staff names. Um, it, it's pretty much the same, I guess, as if you were um, talking to a member of the public. We, when we're working on a story, um, and I, I guess it's my journalism background, um, we go to our staff people and we talk to them about what we want to do, and we make sure that they're comfortable in doing that. Um, if a staff member doesn't is uncomfortable with their name being used, we can just use the generic department name, you know, Mansfield Public Works Department, and uh, have that cover everybody. Um, if there's a specific employee involved, we make sure that they're comfortable with us doing that and um, explaining to them how we're going to be using it. And the same thing if, if we're talking to a member of the public um, in, uh, in any of the stories that we do, because a lot of things uh, we put on our news website first, and we um, provide links on our social media. It's just as if a reporter goes out and is covering a story, and so we make sure that our subjects are, are comfortable with how it's going to be used and the information that we're uh, going to be presenting before we um, post it publicly. Absolutely. Great to get the opt-in um, as much as you can there. And, uh, you know, having staff members' names in, in social media and out in the public can be a really positive thing. It can also be a problematic thing. A lot of our customers with the archives that they have set up uh, have alerts to find out when a staff member is being mentioned. So you got to be really careful about what, what your name is being associated with. So appreciate your, your approach on uh, getting the opt-in in, in all cases. Uh, on that note of monitoring to see what, what's being said on your social media, uh, another question that we had is what is your take on monitoring a conversation on your social media feed, um, you know, especially as a government organization. Well, um, it's a lot easier now for us. We switched over to Facebook Business Manager, which uh, has, to me, a little bit more control, and it also allows us to respond into groups as the city. And so uh, we do try to keep a handle on everything. We have a team. Uh, our social media team, it's pretty much made of the people that are in our communications and marketing department and uh, our communication and marketing team, and it's represented from all the, the uh, departments that use our social media. Um, our police and fire departments, they have their own pages, but 
for the city page. Uh, we have representatives from parks, from the library, um, somebody that's handling public work, somebody that's handling economic development, and we um, we get together occasionally and talk about that. And so we make sure that uh, that information uh, that we're working closely together to get that information out there and to monitor it. Um, you know our our library folks are looking out for the library posts. Our parks and recreation folks are looking out for parks and recreation so that everyone is attuned to the conversations that are being had. We're also members of some of our public groups that are out there in the community. Uh, there's a lot of Facebook groups that are open to people in Mansfield for a lot of different things. And so we, uh, we approach them and say, hey, we would like to be a member of your group so we can address um, any city issues. And it, it has even been, we've been tagged in in posts for questions. Hey, uh, City of Mansfield, we want to know about this. And so it's really about establishing relationships in those groups and helping people understand that we're there to answer questions and help in any way we can. But our team aspect has really been important in us maintaining um, our pages and keeping an eye on the conversations and making sure that we're uh, interjecting when we need to. Got it. Absolutely. And on the notion of team, you mentioned uh, this is a question that I particularly like, which is you mentioned that uh, that Archive Social plays a role in your storytelling efforts. Was that part of the pitch to get buy-in for, for the product in addition to public records? Um, no, it wasn't. An, it, it's been a bonus, I guess, uh, for us. Um, we wanted to uh, we wanted to make sure that we were keeping uh, keeping an eye on all of our content and making sure that we were apply, uh, following all of our, our legal um, requirements, et cetera. So we really wanted to bring Archive Social in for that aspect. We, we have a open records coordinator who handles all of our open records requests, and we knew that at some point um, social media was going to play a big role in that. We get open records requests for text messages. We get open records requests for uh, social media, we get open records requests for everything. So that was one of the reasons why we wanted to bring Archive Social on is we knew that that was going to play an important role when those kinds of uh, situations came up. But we've also learned to use it in other ways. Uh, it's been a great resource for us just to do research about how did we handle a particular um, a particular news element in our community on social media. Um, what was the conversation about this particular issue? So it's been a great resource for us to to use it from that perspective. Well, I'm certainly happy to hear that you you found so many uses outside of the, the legal protection. Uh, going back to the topic that you mentioned of of partaking in community groups, uh, the question that we have here is how many people is it best to have input into community communication? Well, one of the things that we do here, we, we have our team that works very closely together, and we do something that maybe not be that might not be done in other cities. And but this was a requirement many years ago before we were even able to uh, open our social media accounts. Uh, our management said we want to make sure that everyone is uh, prepared and that the information that's going out there is correct. So we on our team. When you're ready to do a post on social media, you send it to our entire team. And at least two members of the team need to sign, sign off on it before it can post. Uh, the only exception is emergency situations. And we do that because everyone's got a different perspective, and it gives um, our team an opportunity to learn more about what each other is doing, but also you know, to catch things like typos to catch things, you know, information that, hey, you may want to add this piece of information to your post. And it's really been a great exchange uh, among the team to learn more from each other. And so uh, we, two people have to sign off on it before it can actually post. So this has been our way of kind of um, adding a little bit of control to uh, social media that can sometimes be a real minefield if you're not careful. And it's like 
it can be the Wild West with everybody coming at you from different places. So we feel very comfortable knowing that the team is involved in almost in pretty much every post that is made on our social media. Uh, that's, that's really yeah, exciting to hear that you have that, that uh, um, kind of protocol to have multiple perspectives look at those posts in those circumstances where you're not in a rush to immediately communicate. I'm going to get us to one last question here uh, to wrap us up for today. And this is a, this is a, a tough one, but I think it's one that, that everyone deals with and, and certainly would love to hear your experience navigating these kinds of circumstances. And the question, Belinda, is how does the story start when trying to explain that progress on development projects is needed but your community's overall sentiment is anti-development. How do you turn them around? Well, uh, for us, it's um, being a community that is very fast growing. Um, we're, we're in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Our closest neighbor to the north is Arlington, which is a large city. Uh, we have been, when I started here at the city 18 years ago, our population was around 30,000 and we're now at about 75. So it's very fast growing and things are changing all the time. Um, so when we do stories related to development, we really focus a lot on not the actual project itself, but the benefits to the community, because that's what it really turns out to be. I, I'm fortunate that when we run stories about economic development on social media, like who's coming now, it's like, I mean, there are most popular posts. We had um, a post that uh, about HEB coming to our community. It's a grocery store chain that's very popular, and uh, within a couple of weeks' time, it has had like a 70,000 reach, and that's almost as many people as in our community. Um, so they're very excited about those kinds of things. So it's, it's about bringing the human element to it and the benefits that for your community. Um, so when you have someone who is anti-development, they may have a difficult time seeing uh, just exactly what the benefit is. So that's the first thing we do in anything that we uh, relate about development is here's the benefits to our community. And then we get into the details of who it is and what's coming and what it's going to mean. Belinda, a perfect way to wrap us up. At the end of the day, uh, storytelling is what takes uh, communication, which, which could just be factual information, and turns it emotional, and turns it relevant, emotional, and in your case, as you've shown, a positive for your constituents. This has been a treasure trove of information. Thank you for all the examples and the insights. We really appreciate you doing this presentation with us. And folks in the line will again follow up with a recording of the presentation. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you.